if I could be in Lisboa with you, I'd be, I'd be with you because it's such a beautiful place. As it is, I'm stuck in grey Oxford um, uh, and I know where I'd rather be. Um, but um, when I first joined um, Nova Lisboa in its new location, I was given a bag. And I think all the students were. And maybe you've got that bag. Um, but on that bag, it says, we are all pioneers. And what I'm going to talk about today is, um, is that role of pioneering, um, mainly in the context of firms um, in very poor places. Um, uh, and I'm going to argue that there aren't enough pioneers and what can be done about it. But before I get into the details of the talk, um, let me set the scene. And um, you're studying economics in the context of development and you're at a business school. And I think that's a wonderful position to be because um, economics can inform both business and public policy. And business and public policy are what's weak and missing in very poor countries. That's why very poor countries stay poor. And economics can explain to quite a high degree why um, they're missing, why, why they're just not, uh, not doing their job. And let me start with a, with a statement that mass poverty is now um, relatively rare. Most countries in the world have got beyond the stage of mass poverty. There's still poverty, there's poverty everywhere, right? If you go on the streets of Washington, you will trip over poor people on the pavements outside the White House. So all societies have poverty to some degree. But mass poverty is a different phenomenon. In a rich country with poor people, you can get rid of the poverty by appropriate redistribution. But in a place with mass poverty, you can't get out of mass poverty by a process of redistribution. Um, you're just redistributing the poverty. And so escaping from mass poverty is not about uh, taxing the rich, it's about raising the productivity of everybody in the society. Um, and, uh, and so that's the phenomenon um, which happened with the Industrial Revolution. Um, and the Industrial Revolution happened relatively recently, about 250 years ago, it got started. Um, uh, civilization had already been around all over the world for 5,000 years before the Industrial Revolution happened. And so we know that it was a very unlikely process. It took a combination of circumstances which were very, very rare. You know, it's like if you play uh, games on these gaming machines, it's like getting three cherries in a row. Um, uh, and we had to wait 5,000 years before we got those three cherries in a row. And boom, it only happened in one place once. The Industrial Revolution happened about 10 miles from where I was born. I was born in a, a provincial town in the north of England. Um, and it's, it was amazing that it happened there. There were very good reasons why it happened there and not in one of the big cities of the world, not in Naples, not in Beijing, um, not in London or Paris or Lisbon, but a little place that was really um, far from um, the, the, the big capital cities. 
but I'm not going to talk about why that happened. Um, uh, I'm writing a book about, um, about all this, and I want to just pick a few features from this book. And uh, the first is a, is a quote, um, and the quote is from a guy called Thomas Hobbes. And Thomas Hobbes was describing uh, life uh, for everywhere in mankind, life before government. And the, the most, one of the most famous quotes from these old guys is, is his phrase, life was nasty, brutal, and short. Um, but actually, that is a, um, a shortened version of what he said. Um, he actually used five adjectives, not three. Nasty, brutal, short, yes, but the first two words he used to describe life before government were solitary and poor. Solitary, meaning isolated, on your own, right? People weren't literally on their own. They were in families, maybe living in villages. But those two first words that are always dropped, solitary and poor, actually go together. And so I, I'm very impressed with Thomas Hobbes because I think he understood at some level a very, very important feature of economics. Uh, and that is that if you are solitary, if you work on your own, then you won't benefit from any economies of scale, nor will you be able to specialize, and therefore you will be poor. Solitary dooms people to poverty. Um, and that was, as Hobbes correctly understood, that was how everywhere was in the world um, before government, but it, was, it persisted really for, for, for the mass of ordinary people until the Industrial Revolution got going. And what, you, what was revolutionary about the Industrial Revolution that escaped from mass poverty is that it enabled ordinary people um, uh, eventually in their millions and billions um, to, uh, to, har to harness the scale economies and with them uh, specialization. Um, so no scale and no specialization we've got mass poverty, and that describes still um, about a billion people in the world, the people I would term the bottom billion, living in countries um, where uh, superficially the organization of production looks rather charming, this peasant farmers, um, but peasant farmers, the household is a solitary, self-sufficient entity. Self-sufficiency sounds great uh, until you try it. Right? Self-sufficiency is the dream of uh, exhausted merchant, exhausted investment bankers who dream of going off and um, uh, and living on a on a Scottish island. Um, uh, self-sufficient. They can afford to do so because they've built up many millions. Right? If you work as a solitary household um, without those many millions, you are doomed to poverty. And that's uh, what Thomas Hobbes understood at some level, solitary and poor. Um, and it describes what is otherwise known as Eden. Um, the, the, the Eden, the term for um, mankind before civilization. Um, 
but it also describes the mass of mankind um, before the Industrial Revolution. And it still describes places like Mozambique, like Timor-Leste, um, where um, to a first approximation, ordinary people, the mass of ordinary people work in these very small um, units of production, micro enterprises. Uh, micro enterprises, the sort, the sort of thing that um, NGOs um, um, find absolutely charming and wonderful. Um, they're not, they're not. Um, uh, they can exist as a fringe activity in a society which is dominated um, by the ability to harness scale and specialization. Um, but if the mass of the population is stuck in small scale, in these uh, farm peasant households, then they're doomed to poverty. Um, so, the modern economy started with the Industrial Revolution, but it's moved a lot further since, um, since the birth of the Industrial Revolution about 250 years ago. The modern economy has made people quite amazingly productive relative to what they were um, uh, before the Industrial Revolution. Um, and I'm going to spend a, a little while describing why a, a country like Portugal no longer has mass poverty. Um, and it's, uh, I call it the, uh, the, the structure of productivity. Um, and um, and it's, uh, if, we, if we think about it um, with, the, with the wisdom of, of pre-industrial revolution societies, the structure of productivity um, is an amazing, miraculous achievement. Um, uh, it's something you probably won't learn in the rest of your course. Um, um, but you learn it now. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a very valuable and important insight to start from. Um, because what we're, not, what we're going to do in this talk is first describe that structure of productivity that makes ordinary people in Portugal, in Britain, in France, so amazingly productive relative to historical standards. And it will also then show you why Eden doesn't have any of the features I'm going to describe and the problems that creates. So we begin the structure of productivity with scale economies at the level of the firm. That was the, the first modern economist, Adam Smith. That's what he spotted. He described a pin factory. Um, uh, it turns out that he never actually saw such a pin factory. He stole the idea from a Frenchman, uh, Diderot, but it seems that Diderot never actually saw a pin factory either. It doesn't matter. Right? The ideas they had were correct. Right? They made up an image of a pin factory and described it. Um, and that's fair enough, it's a, it's a good way of teaching, and that's what they were basically doing. So we start with scale economies in the firm, and even that little step um, is transformational of productivity. Let me give you the example from modern Ethiopia. Ethiopia has only recently started um, modern manufacturing, and so the, the formal and the informal coexist side by side, making the same thing. Um, so one of my younger colleagues did a, a survey of manufacturing in Ethiopia. And, um, and he came up with, with this, that, that he compared a micro enterprise bigger than most, that had four workers, 
Right? So this was a typical micro enterprise with four workers in it. And it was making the same thing as, uh, as a small modern firm, which had 50 workers. So we're going to compare the productivity of those four workers in a micro enterprise, fairly big micro enterprise, with a very small modern firm with 50. The productivity per worker in the factory, in the fir firm with 50 people, per worker, the productivity was 10 times higher. Not 10%, 10 times. Now, if the productivity of workers goes up 10 times, their incomes can go up a lot. Their wages can go up a lot. And that's the first step in the miracle of productivity. The second step, which Adam Smith also described, was specialization. If you bring people together, if you bring 50 people together, they don't all need to do the same thing. 25 can do one task, 25 can do another task. What's the big advantage of that? Why does that help productivity? Well, it's called learning by doing. Um, a famous concept, um, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Kenneth Arrow, um, I think coined that term, learning by doing, um, and showed how powerful it was. Um, specialization within the firm probably delivers even bigger productivity gains than um, economies of scale within the firm. But that was just the first stepping stones on the Industrial Revolution. The next step was interdependence between firms. Um, firms would come together. Uh, and why was interdependence so important? Because it enabled scale economies to develop at the level of clusters um, and in, in value chains. So the modern economy, um, any modern economy, is all about clusters and value chains. So a, what, are, what are they? What, a cluster is when a group of firms doing the same thing um, uh, comes together in the same place. Um, Give you one example of that. Um, it's a uh, it's a city in China that 50 years ago was a fishing village, and now um, two thirds of the world's buttons are made there. Yeah? So two thirds of all the world's buttons made in one town, one city, which 50 years ago was a village. Why are so many of the world's buttons made there? Let's call it Buttonopolis, right? The world capital of buttons. Um, and it's not because there's one firm called Mega Button Incorporated. There is no giant firm. Right? In Buttonopolis, there are just an awful lot of firms making buttons. Why on earth? Do they congregate together? Because they reap scale economies at the level of that cluster. Okay. Such as, well, um, if your very skilled worker retires or gets sick, um, you can hire another one because there's a deep labor market in skills. If your machine breaks, needs repairing, um, there's a deep um, network of firms um, doing repairs and services for the button uh, industry. If you want to sell your buttons, um, you don't have to go around the world um, trying to sell your designs for buttons. The, the designers in Italy and Paris um, each year who are looking for new fashions in buttons, where do they go? They go to Buttonopolis. Right? 
So that's uh, the scale economies at the level of a cluster in buttons. Um, and then there's things called value chains. What are value chains? Value chains are not a group of firms in one place doing the same thing. They're actually a chain of different clusters connected by international trade. Um, and um, you can tell quite a lot just from carrying the on with the button story, because um, when I teach my own students, I, I, I ask them a trick, a trick question and I say, have you ever bought a button? Um, and I have to say, this is a very, very, turns out to be a very gender specific question because none of the, none of the men have bought buttons. But quite a lot of the women have, right? Um, but, it, but even quite a lot of the women have never actually bought a button. Um, you've all got buttons on, right? Um, uh, buttons are a consumer good, but you don't actually buy your buttons as buttons. You buy them, like me, on a shirt. Right? And so who's buying the buttons? Well, it's the people who make the shirts there'll be a cluster of people who make shirts, just as there's a cluster of people who make buttons. They'll be in different places. And so the value chain is to link the, tr the, the production of buttons to the production of shirts. The shirts need the buttons, the buttons need the shirt makers as customers. The firms in the shirt makers have to trust the button makers and vice versa. And so the, the value chain is a business relationship between the firms in one cluster and the firms in another linked by trade. And of course, the buttons and the shirts are just a small part of what is a vast set of chains, chains that go on for many different steps. Right? Um, you, know, you think of something like an iPhone, which is really very, very complicated. Uh, if you ask the question, who knows how to make an iPhone? Nobody knows how to make an iPhone. An iPhone is assembled at many different steps in these different clusters. Right? So the modern economy is clusters and value chains. And what they, what, they, what, what they both characterize by is interdependence between firms. Now, once you've got interdependence, you need um, two more things. You need connectivity. What's connectivity? Well, it applies at many different levels. And I don't just mean e-connectivity like we're using now. Um, connectivity is first and foremost uh, a physical thing about uh, uh, if I wanted to connect my left hand and my right hand, there's two ways of doing it. One is to build a road between them, that's transport connection. And the other is to move my hands closer together, that's density. We get a cluster of things in a city that's predominantly about using density. But of course, the city also needs a lot of transport so that workers can reach um, the factories. Uh, and so the factories can reach their customers, which may be uh, in, in, on a different continent. And so you need a lot of transport. You need the roads within the city. Um, you need the ports and the airports to reach, um, to reach markets in other countries. Right? Um, so you need a lot of connectivity. Uh, the other thing you need for interdependence um, uh, is you need non-human energy. This was the big transformation which actually triggered the Industrial Revolution. Um, the guy who started the Industrial Revolution, that first factory, 
which was a mill. Um, what it did was link two already existing technologies. Richard Arkwright, that the first entrepreneur um, who started the Industrial Revolution, he didn't invent anything. He just, it just occurred to him, he had a really good idea that he could connect a fairly new technology, which was the loom, with a very old technology, which was the water wheel. And so he put a water wheel connected to a loom, so that instead of having to pedal the loom, looms were being operated by people pedaling a wheel, so it was human power. And by connecting to a water wheel, the water wheel, it turned out, had so much non-human energy that um, it would drive many looms. And that's why um, he blundered into scale economies, because the, to reap the benefits of the water wheel, you couldn't just build a water wheel and run one loom, that wasn't economic at all. You needed to, to run several hundred looms, and so you needed several hundred workers. If you've got several hundred workers in a factory, then you could do specialization and all the rest of it. Um, so that was the, the first step in non-human energy. We've of course moved far, far beyond water power. Um, but both connectivity and non-human energy need something else. And so we're building this structure of productivity, which started with uh, scale and specialization in the firm, and then moved to scale and specialization in clusters linked by value chains. Then we turn to that calls for interdependent, that calls for connectivity and uh, non-human energy. And the next step is that connectivity and non-human energy require a lot of investment. Somebody has to pay for that investment. Investment is resources that you don't, that you choose not to consume, but instead of using those resources to consume, you use um, to, uh, you spend the energy and the time and everything um, to create the roads or to create uh, the, um, uh, the, the dams that make hydroelectric power or something. So, invest, so the investment that's needed for connectivity and non-human energy, that investment needs a lot of saving. And most people, when they're poor, um, don't want to save. Um, they're poor and so they want to consume. Uh, and so it's sensible to match up the entrepreneurs who might find the opportunities to invest with rich people who don't have opportunities to invest, but do um, have incomes that are high enough to, to permit them to save. And so that's what financial markets do. Financial markets link the people who can afford to save with the entrepreneurs who have opportunities to invest. Now that is the, the minimum description of the structure of productivity of a modern economy. Right? Firms doing specialization, uh, division of labor and uh, scale, um, feeding into these clusters and value chains, uh, big investments, um, and the investments uh, uh, achieved through, uh, through, through the finance industry. And now contrast that with Eden. Go back to Eden and that peasant economy which NGOs seem to found, find very charming, but dooms people to mass poverty. Eden 
a society of small peasant farmers farming in a broadly in a self-sufficient manner. Eden has none of that, none of it. Um, and what are the key components, the key organizational components that are missing in Eden? And there are two vital organizations which do all the things I've described in a modern economy. And one of those things is firms. Firms, um, uh, the way it's often taught is firms provide capital. Firms don't provide capital, firms provide organization. Firms are the, the entities whose skill is to organize workers and link them to uh, customers of products. And so at one end in a modern economy, you've got workers who want a job. And at the other end, you've got consumers who want to buy uh, a car or a phone or a house or whatever. And the link between the workers and the customers that link is provided by a vast chain of firms. The firms who organize the workers to make the product, to sell the product, to transport the product, and to finance the product. So Eden has none of those firms, or very, very, very few. Um, in a pure, peasant economy, it has none of that organizational capital whatsoever. Right? So the firms are missing. But the other thing that's missing uh, is government. That's actually what Thomas Hobbes spotted, that without government, uh, life is indeed um, solitary, uh, poor, nasty, brutal, and short. What does government do um, in the structure of productivity that I've described. Well, along with firms, it makes investments. So firms are going to be doing some investments, but for example, a lot of the investments in connectivity, the roads in a city, um, probably the airport, probably the port, um, those huge investments are provided by the state. Um, and what is, what, what, what is a government? In the, what, what do we mean by government here? Well, government is, um, uh, is bringing people together around some common purpose, whether it's a democracy or not. Um, uh, people have um, sufficient common purposes because we have common goals. Uh, we want to be prosperous, um, we need non-human energy, and so we need some source of non-human energy, and most of the non-human energy in the world uh, is provided by governments rather than by business. In some, some countries, um, my own Britain, um, most of the energy is provided by the private sector. Turns out that's very, it's a very, very difficult market to do with private uh, provision um, because it's a network industry. And if you, do, and if you do network industries, you need a lot of regulation. The regulation turns out to be very much more complex than we'd initially appreciated. Uh, uh, what other things do you need? Um, for modern firms, um, as, well as, as well as infrastructure, um, you need security. Um, and security is a very, very hard um, service to provide. Um, just look at what's happened in Afghanistan. Right? Um, Afghanistan was the consequence of 
um, some very foolish dreams um, uh, and uh, has turned into a complete tragedy. Um, you're starting the study of development at a very good time because one of the things you have to pioneer is the world beyond those silly dreams, the world beyond the dream that uh, a society like Afghanistan could transform into Denmark um, by uh, external intervention and pressure and money. Um, uh, it can't. Um, the transformation of a place like Afghanistan will still take an awful long time. It's been set back very badly by these silly dreams, um, but it's going to be a, a, basically a domestic process, a domestic struggle. Um, so you've learned that provision of security is very hard in a society. Without security, um, economic activity is extremely difficult. Right? So firms basically are not going to operate in an environment which does not provide adequate security. Um, uh, and uh, one other essential function of government is the enforcement of contracts through a system of courts. Um, uh, this was the um, very early stages of government, was the use of uh, government power, military power, which created the birth of government, um, first to provide security in exchange for uh, for taxation, and then to use that um, force to enforce private contracts. Um, so we need firms and we need governments, and very poor countries have neither. Um, since I haven't got much time left, I want to drill down on why it's so hard to get enough firms in very poor countries like Mozambique or Timor-Leste um, or South Sudan, or Sudan, or, um, Mali. Um, uh, so why are, they, why are there just not enough firms there? Why are there too few pioneering firms? Um, and let's um, go back to uh, Buttonopolis and the idea of a cluster. Um, so suppose you were a pioneering firm trying to make buttons in, um, where should we make buttons? Sierra Leone, Mozambique, Timor-Leste. Yeah. Um, I was giving this example for a few years before an African friend of mine who's an entrepreneur said, I did try pioneering a button factory um, in my home country of Zimbabwe. Um, uh, so I said, well, what happened to your button factory? Um, because wages are an awful lot cheaper in Zimbabwe by then than, uh, than in Buttonopolis in China where wages are very high. Um, and my friend said, oh, my, my button factory went bankrupt. Um, and that's inevitable. Um, why? Because he was the first firm in Zimbabwe, and he was competing with this immense cluster, which had two thirds of all the button firms in the world, and so even though his wages were cheaper, the scale economies at the level of the cluster, all those advantages that kick in at the level of the cluster were too big that they outweighed the fact that wages were cheaper in Zimbabwe. Um, suppose you needed 10 button firms to come together in a cluster uh, in order for any of those 10 firms to be viable. Um, and suppose for a moment, let's put you as um, 
uh, MBA students in a business school, right? So you're not doing development for the next 10 seconds, you're masters of business administration students. And it's a case study for you overnight. Um, there are, you've got the opportunity to go into a place with cheap labor uh, to, to produce buttons. And you know that if there are, if 10 firms go in, um, all 10 will be profitable. Um, but the first firm will go bank, will lose money. Um, what is your best strategy? Do you go in as a pioneer? And if not, what strategy do you adopt? Right? So that's your overnight task uh, in your MBA class. And now you can heave a deep sigh of relief that you didn't choose to do an MBA uh, in, uh, in, bus in business administration. You're actually doing development hopefully most of you. Um, if you are doing a Master's of Business MBA, um, then um, try it overnight, but I'll tell you the right answer now, um, unless anybody likes to volunteer. Does anybody like to volunteer what the right answer is? What's the best strategy? And it's not invest in the first firm, be the first firm. The best strategy is to wait until nine others have gone before you. And now, can you think of the catch-22? Probably catch-22 doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, uh, can you think of the trap if the best strategy is to wait for nine other firms to go before you? The trap is that if that's the best strategy, nine other firms never do go before you. Everybody waits, right? everybody waits. For how long? Potentially forever. Right? And that's the pioneer problem in very poor countries. It doesn't make sense to be the pioneer. We could do exactly the same structure with a value chain. You're not in a value chain, but you're competing with a value chain. If enough different types of firm come and set up in your, uh, alongside you, then you will be able to enter the value chain, <coughs> but you don't. Huh? <coughs> um, uh, I'll give you an example of, uh, of why China was able to develop. And China was able to develop because uh, American and especially European firms did move into China, but they moved into China in a coordinated way. Let me give you an example of a big Swedish firm. And it worked out that China was the future. It was had over a billion people. It was already starting to grow. And so it was a fair bet that um, uh, China would be a good place to produce and sell its goods. And so it went to all its other Swedish suppliers in its value chain and said, um, will you, we're going to move to China. Do you want to come with us? And because China was such an obvious future market, all, sweet, all the, that Swedish firm suppliers said, yeah, we'll come too. And so they all moved together in a coordinated way. Why did they coordinate? Because China was such a big market. Now replace the word China with um, the word Mali or the word Mozambique. You know, Mozambique's the future of the world economy. It doesn't just doesn't have the same appeal, credibility. Right? And so China was big enough that it could actually uh, attract these firms that were already established in their markets. And so it, China was able to plug in instantly into, uh, into the 
the global value chain which connected the product with consumers. Mozambique, Timor-Leste, they don't have that opportunity. They're just not big enough. They're just not credible as this is the big economy of the future. Um, and so there's a missing step, which is the coordination. China, the firms were able to coordinate themselves because it was such a big market. Um, uh, when I finish my book, and, uh, and if you buy it, you'll be able to read the story of why Mauritius was able to break into garments. Um, and the answer was an extremely unlikely set of circumstances which began in Hong Kong, where a bunch of Hong Kong manufacturers all coordinated together to move to Mauritius. It was an amazingly unlikely set of uh, and fortuitous set of circumstances. Um, and we learn from uh, China and Mauritius that this is just not going to happen through automatic market processes uh, in places like Timor-Leste or Mozambique. Um, so what can we do? We, what is missing is a coordinator that will shepherd a lot of firms together that will say, we need 10 button makers in this cluster and you are the 10 firms we've attracted, we, we would like to come and, um, uh, and we'll, we'll actually uh, subsidize you, all of you, um, to, do, to make that first move. Right? And we'll pay for the cost of training. The first, per, the first firms to arrive, those first 10 firms, won't find any skilled labor. Uh, so you all have to train. That's a cost switch, um, which is an investment, which uh, the firms in Buttonopolis don't have to make because there's already a train, a big pool of trained labor. So um, who's going to play that role of coordination? And that takes me to my final step, which is international public policy. What's missing here is uh, the coordinating role of international public policy. And the relevant agencies are, uh, are components of, uh, of, of aid agencies, but they're a specialist component. They're called development finance institutions. Um, the World Bank has such a, an agency, it's called the International Finance Corporation. Uh, Britain has one called uh, CDC, used to be called the Commonwealth Development Corporation. France has one, and so on and so forth. A lot of countries. There are about 40 of these things around the world. Um, but they've never understood their job. They've never understood that their role is um, to actually uh, bring firms in a coordinated way uh, to overcome that pioneering problem. Um, uh, I'm trying to get them to understand that problem. And so for the last three years, I've convened um, 30 of the, of, the, of the 40. I've convened them in Oxford once a year um, to try and raise their game um, in the poorest countries. So I've got the, I've got the biggest 30. Um, and they are starting to, to change their ways. Um, they're entirely, who they recruit are the MBA students who couldn't get into Goldman Sachs. And the MBA students are taught, get the deal, get the, get the smart deal, the profitable deal. And if you think about it, that's not the skill that's required here. Um, but because they all think that is their, what they're supposed to be doing, these 30 development finance institutions compete against each other. What I try and show to them is that they're not in competition. They've got the same task. The same objective is to get very poor countries out of mass poverty, which won't happen until they overcome the pioneering problem. 
Um, they're just starting to do it. Um, that will be the battle that when you go and become professionals, young professionals, that will be the battle that's raging. And I need you to be pioneers in that battle. And that battle is the battle to get firms which will pioneer that structural productivity with which I started. Very few people currently understand what I just told you. Um, I need you to be pioneers. And so I hope that Pedro has given you those bags saying we're all pioneers and I hope you live up to it. And on that note, let me hand you back to Pedro and we've got a few minutes for questions or comments. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, uh, it, it was a wonderful lecture. I have just a, I just have a problem, which is I don't have the questions here. Uh, so. Can we have the questions on the screen? In the meantime, Paul, uh, I would have... Uh, so actually there is a question already in the screen. Um, so so let's, uh, so let's organize these questions. Um, so the first question, aren't there any programs incentivizing pioneer, pioneering companies to be founded in the developing countries? First question, um, let's collect maybe two or three. Um, and is a possible way to increase productivity to unite African countries uh, through a single market? Um, I would actually add a question to these two, uh, yeah. which, which is on... Um, on local governments, on, on, on say, you were talking, uh, Paul, about Mozambique, for instance. So, um, and, and you, were, you were flagging the, the, the problems of clustering firms and, and to a certain extent of urbanization, which is very much against the interests of, uh, of some governments in, say, Africa, I'm yeah. Mozambique, for instance. So, so how, how do you think about, you know, policy uh, in such a context? So that would be my yeah, first that's, question. That's a great question. So let me start with the issue of local firms. Um, is there a tension between foreign firms and local firms? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, there's been quite a lot of research on this. Um, quite the opposite. So let me give you the story of the... Uh, of, of what happened in Bangladesh. Bangladesh now has a vast garments industry, $30 billion a year of garment exports, 4 million young women working in the garments industry, which has transformed uh, gender relations in Bangladesh because it's given young women an exit option from dependence on the family. Uh, and so it's greatly increased the power of young women in Bangladeshi society. And it's uh, lifted the uh, society gradually uh, out of mass poverty by this enormous increase in productivity enabled by this huge garments industry. So how did the garments industry start? It started with one foreign firm uh, coming in in about 1980. And uh, that firm um, was never very profitable, it struggled. Um, uh, uh, at the end of the first year, um, half its workers quit, not because they were bad jobs. And by the standards of the time, they were rather good jobs. 
quit because they realized that this firm didn't understand how to operate in the very complex political environment of Bangladesh. They didn't understand the politics and they didn't understand the local culture. And so they were making mistake after mistake after mistake. The workers quit because after a year, they had learned enough about how the world garments market worked that they decided they could do it much better. And so they set up their own firms. And so the, 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 the Bangladeshi garments industry, which is huge, is largely Bangladeshi owned. And it's, it's created by local firms copying, learning from um, the first foreign firm, which was a pioneer by mistake. It didn't realize how difficult it was, um, given how little it knew. Um, the, um, would it be a good idea to increase the size of African markets by linking them together? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and that is starting to happen. There's, there's two very, very good developments just in the last year or so. One is the launch of the Africa Free Trade Area, um, which is for the first time offering an opportunity to leapfrog uh, into a pan-African market. And the second piece of really good news is that the new general secretary of the director general of the World Trade Organization uh, is an African woman, a friend of mine, Ngozi Nkonjo-Iwiala, a former finance minister uh, of Nigeria, uh, a former managing director of the World Bank, enormously experienced. And so she is the perfect person to push Africa, African governments into actually linking up. Um, uh, even when they're linked up as one market, uh, right, there are smaller markets, there are fewer people than, uh, than India, um, and it's still not a very big, big economy, but it's a whole lot bigger than just trying to get Mozambique on its own or Mali on its own. And so it's a very good uh, point that linking up is a sensible idea. And that also links to the other question, which was about urbanization. Uh, in fact, my colleague Tony Venables and I um, did a, a sort of simulation research a few years ago where we, we, we rubbed out Africa's borders um, as, as impediments to trade. And we found that once you rubbed out the borders, 80% um, of Africa's cities grew. Um, why? Because there was a lot more opportunities with bigger markets there were more opportunities for clusters, value chains, specialization. And so nearly all these cities um, grew because they started to build their own clusters, uh, just like Batonopolis in China. Um, now, uh, is the future of Africa urbanization? Yes. And potentially that's very good news. Um, between now and 2050, we know from the demographics that the African urban population will triple. Right? So if you look at the typical African town or city now, and then think of what that would be like in 2050, in 2050, it will be three times as large as it is now, and so two thirds of the city of 2050 is not yet built. Now that is a huge opportunity um, uh, to build a city that works. Uh, in fact, the, the, uh, the thing of which I'm most proud in recent years is, there, is that within the organization of the International Growth Center, um, Tony Venables, uh, uh, Ed Glazer and myself created an organization called Cities That Work, which has been hugely successful. And if you go on a website, um, 
of cities that work, you'll find a load of, um, of material um, which is really designed not for you, it's designed for mayors in low-income cities as to how they can actually transform their city into a city that will work in 2050. The tragedy is that if you look across Africa at the moment, the third of the city of the future that is built, that one third, mostly doesn't work. It's congested uh, and uh, it doesn't have reliable energy. So if you remember connectivity and non-human energy as the basic things which economic productivity needs, the typical African city at the moment doesn't have good connectivity. It's very congested. Um, and it doesn't have uh, reliable uh, electricity, which is the, the vital form of non-human energy. Um, and so moving from, uh, if we just triple the size of the city and do nothing else, uh, we end up with a more congested city uh, with even less reliable and affordable uh, non-human energy. And so it's a vital matter that governments recognize that urbanization is their future and they embrace it. Um, and they put a lot of resources into it. Urbanization is a national priority. It's not just a priority for the mayors of cities. And African governments are very reluctant uh, to embrace that urban future. Why? Because the votes that they find it easiest to control are rural votes. And so typically, um, in a lot of African countries, the opposition controls the capital city, uh, whereas the government controls the countryside. And so it doesn't uh, like to favor uh, urbanization. Uh, nor do the donors. The donors, because of the pressure from NGOs, are all about rural, rural, rural development. Um, uh, I talked with um, uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf about this when she was the president of Liberia. And, uh, and she said, you, you realize you're the first person who's given me that message that our future is urban. Um, the donors all keep telling me, get your city, get, your, get the people living in cities to go back to the countryside. Um, and she said, that's obviously not going to happen. It's unrealistic. Um, but we need to start thinking about making these cities work better. Well, uh, Pedro, I think I've right up against the, the limits of time. Um, I think so, Paul. So uh, I'd like to thank you very much. I think we are uh, already a, a bit over time. So, so I'd like to thank you very much for your uh, talk here today. Uh, I hope to see you soon in Lisbon. And I would like to thank everyone for coming. I wish everybody a fantastic academic year. Thank you.